Welcome to Kizuna, a taste and innovation podcast. Like Kizuna, the Japanese word for enduring bonds between people, we believe in the power of co-creation when it comes to developing the newest technologies and advanced materials for the future. In our first series, we dive deep into the evolving mobility and speak to the most fantastic industry experts out there. My name is Francisca. I'm an innovation advisor and your host of this podcast. And with me, I have Jay Letter, as always, who is the technology innovation strategist, fusionist, has multiple you know, years of experience in the future of manufacturing, sustainability, the circular economy, the metaverse. And today we have a very special topic, the next generation of manufacturing and supply chains. Jay, how are you today <laughs> and what are your thoughts on this topic? Hey, hello. As always, beautiful to be with you here and to do this amazing video podcast. So how I am, I'm fine. Thank you for asking. Um, about the topic that is right now, some of the, the in the audience will be a bit scared in the beginning until they realize what kind of special topic we have prepared for them today. So maybe, maybe we can give them a hint, actually, and dive deep into the sci-fi uh, direction. Ah, you know, give them a hint. Them One a of hint. my favorite uh, science fiction um, series that has a special device that can do anything what you like. So maybe they already know, but I would uh, suggest that we introduce the guest, right? Yes, let's go to the guest. I'm super excited to have you here. Um, CEO and co-founder of Atlant 3D Nanosystems, Maxime Plahotniuk. And um, yeah, Maxime, welcome to the series. Um, yeah, maybe you can you can just introduce yourself a little bit and then I say something to your company. It's one of the most, I would say, groundbreaking startups out there. Um, you've managed within three years to develop a highly scalable and accurate technology um, from idea stage um, to, to, yeah, everything works kind of. Um, so introduce yourself, please, and tell me what is Atlant 3D Nanosystems doing? Hi, guys. Uh, thank you very much for inviting. I'm extremely happy to, to be here. And uh, I recall the moment when I first met uh, Jay and uh, he mentioned that, hey, Maxim, we want to participate. And uh, I didn't expect that this format would be so uh, cool. So thank you very much. And, and nice, uh, Francesca, that we that we can have all together this discussion. Um, so thank you for great words about Atlant. Um, um, as a founder, I'm, of course, a little bit skeptical what we can achieve, but as a as an innovation leader, I look forward into the future and I want also believe that by achieving these great uh, goals that you mentioned, we can change a lot. We can change the future for the whole humanity. So about myself, um, um, I started uh, with the company from IT, as you mentioned, um, three, four years ago. Uh, uh, when I uh, had a very bare idea and I came to a conference in Barcelona and I pitched first time and uh, I didn't expect that I would meet anyone who can make uh, this idea to work together with me. But uh, luckily, I found a few people like this. This is one of my co-founders, uh, Ivan Kudrata, who joined the, the company and, uh, and now going on further. And also Professor Julian Bachmann in Germany, who gave us the lab, and we start experimenting, making something different and that nobody else did before. So to give you a teaser, what we actually did, we built up the first ever atomic layer manufacturing prototype. So imagine that you have the tool that can print, process, 
atomic materials uh, layer by layer. So what we say now with this technology, we want to revolutionize electronics and not only electronics, photonics, optics, many other different industries. This is where we start. And what we add further on after the, the, the period, we add atom by atom. So I hope this gives the, some hint to what we do. Yeah, it, it sounds it's a great idea. Um, Jay, you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's, yeah. it's, the thing is, whenever I'm with Maxime explaining this to someone, mm. people need to digest it. They need to realize what he's really talking about. Guys out there, Maxime has built a molecular assembler. It's a 3D printer on the nano level. You can print out materials. Imagine having a smartphone that you download the template, you pay for the license, and you print it out. Nothing assembled, it's printed out in one piece. And this is something I do not often use the word disruption, mm. because mostly we do not see disruption, even if it's in front of us and uh, makes funny movements. This here is disruption. Because the, the implications out of this is we can decentralize manufacturing. We can minimize the footprint of our products due to the whole supply chain, transporting stuff from A to B across the whole planet. When you mm have -hmm. decentralized manufacturing, when you can, let's say, uh, Maxim, you will explain a bit later on your manufacturing hubs on this idea. When you have, let's say, in several entities, these manufacturing hubs and you do not really rely on some bigger place they can use it of course as well but it's more or less a democratization of manufacturing and this is one of the most exciting things so when i've mentioned my favorite one of my favorite favorite science fiction uh, series which is of course star trek yeah. um, where you have the the <laughs> replicator uh t Earl gray hot uh, of course, it's not right now, maybe sooner or later, we'll see, but it's really this, this uh, type of thing. Um, an additional, additional uh, example that I would, uh, would like to use here is um, when you've mentioned in the intro the metaverse, of course, meanwhile, everyone is referring to Neil Stevenson. Here, I would like to refer to Neil as well, because he has written in his novel, The Diamond Age, exactly what Maxime has built. And the most beautiful thing is, Maxime did not know what he's building. <laughs> it was already described by Neil Stevenson with something so mind-blowing. And I simply love this approach. Okay, enough uh, yeah. credits. Now back to you. Yeah, I was like I was thinking before we really dive deep into the technology and also the future, and you know, what does that mean for manufacturing and the supply chains? I wanted to um talk with both of you more about like the current, you know maybe not pain points, but what are the current challenges in manufacturing at the very moment, right? I mean, we now like, you know, Maxime's techno technology is out there. Um, you know, maybe you can start, Jay, but what do you think when, especially looking at the automotive industry and mobility landscape, what challenges do we face here at the moment? So the challenge within the automotive industry is, of course, we have global supply chains. We are, uh, it's, it's something so, so complex that you don't know if something happens how it impacts the overall supply chain it's not just one player two players majority of the oems of the automotives have something around 12 till fifteen thousand suppliers if something happens in between you don't know where the tipping points are what kind of effects does it, does it have so when you are building, let's say, from the dashboard, the whole plastic stuff and so on, and then it's shipped across the whole planet, or if you are uh, partly building your cars, of course, to save uh, some kind of, of taxes in another country, then you, you ship your half-built car to this country where it's finally assembled so that you can claim it's made by whatever, uh, simply to uh, avoid taxes, you are constantly shipping from A to B. It's a huge impact on the environment. It's a huge waste of resources um, only for the transportation. We are currently in, in manufacturing, in most of the industries, living the just-in-time principle, which means we do not really have logistics. We do not really have, uh, uh, we have logistics, we do not really have warehousing. 
only a small piece so that the uh, production can continue. So the trucks with the parts, with what you, you need to assemble are highly, it's, it's a high dense choreography where they are driving around your, your manufacturing facility, time is money uh, until they are really needed, then they deploy everything and uh, the manufacturing can continue. This is of course the whole infrastructure on the streets, the local emissions, all of this, this stuff is simply uh, um, constantly polluting. And of course it increases the price of your of, of your products mm. so right now with building decentralized structures when you get stuff on demand you do not build them on stock simply to keep it somewhere um, when um, you use local talents um, local uh, uh, available uh, uh, raw materials when you can let's say take we, we had already with with uh, um, uh, with uh, the Tejin uh, a brilliant people from Tejin um, the 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 intro into how polymers are being deconstructed so that you can reuse them and so on so with Maxim's technology um, I foresee here a future where we do not ship half parts half goods and so on across the planet but only the raw materials the the source that is then being used for filling it into these 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 devices so that they can print all these materials this mm. is something radically really radically new i'm getting goosebumps just by thinking about yeah. It. yeah and maxi maybe you maybe you can share your thoughts on the current challenges and why actually um 3d printing could here be the solution um, yeah, of course. Um, uh, actually, 3D printing uh, had uh, two uh, stages of development. And the first stage was not so bright as we see it now. The acceptance level for additive manufacturing and 3D printing was quite challenging because people didn't find the use cases. What uh, Jay mentioning, and this was about the level of acceptance by the industry and the global society. So when uh, there was a need for on-demand manufacturing and actually the customization, the, the biggest value of 3D printing, additive manufacturing in our technology that you can do customization on demand, not only manufacturing, but customization. And uh, this is uh, when uh, uh, the industries like automotive or aerospace, uh, uh, the semiconductor industry require a lot of customization because they also extremely expensive, these industries. The infrastructure that exists today on a global level is extremely complex, it's extremely expensive. And, and you cannot customize uh, solutions easily, like from sensor or to even the meta metal parts for uh, like uh, airplanes. And this is very difficult. That's why our innovation cycles right now in, are extremely long. Now imagine if we enable on-demand manufacturing and customization, the innovation cycle turns from years to months or weeks or days. And then engaging local talents and uh, local materials. And uh, this is absolutely paradigm shifting uh, approach. Now we can all can build, innovate on with the speed of light almost. Imagine that. Yeah, crazy. Um, one additional thing, if we stay at the semiconductors, I do not know how many of in the audience know really how chips are being produced. You have these wafers where strong ultraviolet light is building these structures, multiple times and so on. The thing is, um, on this wafer, all these chips are not perfect. They have small errors, faults built, built in, flaws. So regularly you then take the chip test it mm, is it this category is it that category um this multiple cores more or less you cannot activate all of the cores because they are simply defective so you sell a defective thing more or less defective in our meaning um as a four core chip with this technology was what maxim has there is simply no defective material anymore mm. and so it's something sustainable where the whole branch that comes off the assembly line is simply how it was designed. The next thing we should keep in mind is when we are in semiconductors, when we've built all of this, and it costs really crap loads of money, 
Um, we're talking about, about uh, three-digit millions that are invested only into these high-end, uh, high ultraviolet light machines and so on. So here, um, as soon you've set up something, you have built something. We've heard it in the past when simply small logistical mistakes were made in the chips. When you have, of course, some kind of, okay, now it, it, it can have an overrun uh, and so on. So you need to, with software, uh, roll out something that starts to repair the chip. We had this several times where, where they were defective. With this technology, you simply can modify. So you do not lose the whole bank, uh, whole, whole branch of production. You simply stop it, modify what might be defective, and you continue with the corrected product. So mm -hmm. simply the invest, the ongoing, this is something so sustainable. And uh, sooner or later, we should as well discuss, for example, what does it mean for the people, for the market, new yeah. jobs and so on. But this, leave it a bit uh, to the past. Yeah, maybe we come to this, uh, to come <laughs> to this in a second. But I'm curious, I mean, more from like my perspective, a very generalistic perspective. Um, okay, this thing, you know, can create materials, you know. How many materials um, can this nano printer create at the very moment? And where are you there? Like, what can I imagine here? Um, so we started with this technology development and uh, the background technology that we use, it's called atomic layer deposition. Mm -hmm. This technology was uh, first patented in Russia in the uh, 70s but uh, Finnish across the border in Helsinki, uh, there are a few professors who pick up this technology and they start developing extremely extensive, ex extensive. they start bringing to industry. And within this 40 years, the, the Finnish team and then uh, Dutch and everyone else in the world pick up this, they uh, in the research space validated more than 450 different materials. So when we communicate to, uh, as our company, we always say, guys, look, these 450 materials are also applicable to our technology. Mm -hmm. Of course, we didn't validate them all uh, at once uh, right now, but we started from uh, 10 now and uh, we'll move further on because this requires some time, validation and adjustments, process development, but the opportunity that you can use 450 materials in the future, no, no other technology can tell you that. No, none of them actually. And these materials the, was uh, what is the most beautiful part of this. This is what uh, Jay partially touched, that the pure material, the raw material, you get in a gas phase or liquid phase that you turn into, into vapor, a gas. And imagine what can be done out of this. You have the stock of rocks and you turn rocks into a liquid with certain uh, chemical processes and you get some pure materials out of this. And then basically you can come with a later, later stage idea that we have a lot of rocks in asteroid belt on Earth. There are a lot of waste from uh, mining and all of this can be turned into pure liquids or pure gases that can be used for this type of manufacturing. So in the end, what we will get, we will get a pure, manuf a pure sustainable manufacturing by using almost 100% of materials. Wow, like, um, yeah, it's like, it's, uh, it's impressive. I mean, maybe we can, we can also, like, is there like an example that you can share with us, you know, um, um, like, which is a little bit more into detail, for example, um, I remember that, you know, if we would use um, this printer in space, you know, what opportunities are here, um, especially when it comes to, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> let's let's be let's stick to the sci-fi <laughs> world, I would say, because I think that's like easier for the people also to understand. I think you you are going a little bit ahead of what I was I supposed yeah. to say, but that's fine. I like your enthusiasm. Oh, yes. So yeah. uh, I didn't mention, uh, but you just bring in the point that uh, indeed this technology can work also in space. And uh, we came up to this uh, thought after analysis, even after the first year of uh, developing our prototype. And when we realized this, we contacted uh, NASA, 
later ESA, and suddenly we, we found people who were interested in these organizations. We built even the first prototype, we delivered to NASA, that we sold the first prototype. An idea that we want to bring this uh, first prototypes into space, uh, or first gra zero gravity test and then to ISS, to exactly demonstrate that it can work it's in space. But the benefit of this technology to in, in space that with the gases, you can direct them with a pressure any direction you want, and they are not like liquid or solid material that will fly uh, in the in the at zero gravity in the whole uh, uh, compartment, and you cannot catch them. Mm -hmm. uh, with the gases, you can easily catch them. The gases are used as a thrust uh, for directing uh, satellites and rockets to the orbits. Even so, this is basically the same type of technology. So what you can do with these pure materials with, that you get from a gas phase uh, materials, you can build atomic layers. Why you need material, atomic layers in space? Because basically one way uh, of benefit is that you can start prototyping devices for in-space missions. Like let's say you send scientists to make some biomedical experiments, testing how the cells growing in space and you need uh, uh, organ on chip, let's say brain on chip and see how the behavior um, of the cells happening in space because you have zero gravity and you don't know how they would grow the I mean, stem cells. And here you can print your own test micro device, microfluidic device or an other type of device, and then you can uh, easily iterate, you can change this. Because delivering some sensors or devices from Earth to space, even with Elon Musk, uh, SpaceX uh, company, it's still expensive. And there you will have the device, the nanofabricator, that will do this job for you. Another uh, opportunity is, let's say, now we're targeting for Artemis mission to set up a base on the uh, moon or even on Mars. This, the travel time, especially for Mars, is half a year. Mm -hmm. And you and you have a lot of rocks around and probably even gases underneath, under the core, uh, under the, uh, the, the, the rocks. And what you can do, you can set up your own uh, decentralized on-demand manufacturing of any component you want. And if we look even further on, like uh, long-term missions, I think... Uh, in 50 years, we might even dream about this, not even dream, coming to close uh, to implementation of this. So we need technologies that will create manufacturing on a longer uh, travel missions. This is a standard 3D printing. This is our technology, atomic layer manufacturing. This is uh, other type of uh, additive manufacturing technologies. And this gives a freedom to innovate and bring uh, nece necessary parts to, to, to the infrastructure. Mm. Uh, like a more uh, relevant example, uh, biggest problem now on Earth is actually communication. So uh, even interchip communication. So let's say you have two uh, um, integrated circuits and the communication between them is based on uh, um, electronic signal transmission through the uh, through the just a copper wire. Copper wire can deliver only one signal. If so, uh, all the industry is working to make optical uh, connectors because through optical connector you can send many signals. They just uh, you can change the angle uh, uh, and then you can send a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, data through the optical fiber. The problem with optical fiber, and this also used for internet communication, like uh, intercontinental, mm -hmm. that uh, it has a decay uh, and uh, a lot of losses. So what scientists uh, found that they uh, developed some material um, based on uh, fluoride uh, compounds, and they found that if we bring this material and grow them at the zero gravity or microgravity, they have no defects. And, and defects actually the core of this uh, decay and the losses. And uh, basically they get uh, optical fiber that has no losses. And the, then the communication for interchip or for even optical cable intercontinental becomes extremely efficient. The data transmission becomes much faster. We don't need to spend so much energy on this. 
So there are a lot of now startups that uh, and companies in US and a few in Europe that wants to build manufacturing facilities for this optical fiber. What our technology can do is also look into that space where we can manufacture optical fibers for different applications for these optical transmission communication purposes. Mm -hmm. So this is more like a near future that we yeah. evaluate now. Like, yeah. uh, and the previous example is kind of looking into the far future, what can be done even further. And then the one example that Jay provided is a replicator that can make even food. We didn't think about that we can make food yet, but who knows, a molecular assembly of them sandwiches in space, kind of in 100 years, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. One thing that might as well be, I huge opportunity to solve some issues in on, on, on Earth is, for example, circular economy means in detail that uh, waste from one industry can become a valuable resource for the other industry. This is the idea behind circular economy. So when we are talking about gases, about decomposing something to have it as, as a resource material for then, of course, uh, Maxim's technology. This might be as well a huge opportunity to get valuable trash that right now is being mechanically decomposed, that then is simply shredded. Mostly it lands in pavement. If you have these resources identified, then you could use them, um, like with what, what uh, uh, Tejin has uh, then described, uh, this chemical dispo uh, decomposing and so on. And you have these valuable resources in situ when you need them, where you need them, and print out new buildings, new, okay, not buildings, but a lot, uh, smaller components, simply to have this local manufacturing. Mm. What Maxim as well has mentioned with this doting um, uh, through the manufacturing of the, 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 the uh, fiber, uh, um, this, the um, fluorite doting, was it, right? Um, so here we are touching new types of materials. It's not just these doted materials. We are talking as well about metamaterials, so materials with completely new behavior. This is as well something I would like to point out, which is very important. Currently, we have knowledge of many theoretical materials that might be super cool, but they do not scale. It's simply too complex, too complicated to build these on a scalable level. With such technologies, you can simply do it. And here comes again material companies like Tejin. They are this, this deliver, delivering secret source companies that can set up these necessary technologies that can uh, uh, build the, the, the IP behind it, that can describe to what kind of materials and how they can be used. What we've learned in our previous about circular economy sustainability, mm -hmm. this overall value chain that you have fully documented, how was not just the footprint during building it, if you can use waste to rebuild something, then you are taking out of your environment something toxic and turning it into something productive. Mm -hmm. So here, many, many benefits, and I see a huge opportunity for material companies. I see a huge opportunity for material designers. Designers that can simply articulate, that can help you to find new use cases for your cool materials. And this is one of the most exciting things ever. Yeah. Maxine. I just, yeah, I just <laughs> want to add, uh, since uh, Jay, you mentioned about meta materials, <clears throat> uh, what um, we identified as a huge opportunity for us uh, and also for near future, I mean, near future, it's like two, four, four plus years is that um, and this is also a big uh, challenge for standard semiconductor industry that a lot of these mega trends um, and emerging applications like metamaterials, new type of optical devices like smart glasses, uh, uh, 6, uh, 5G, also applications like uh, quantum computing, superconductors, 2D nanoelectronics uh, or new type of batteries or energy devices they all uh, have problems of uh, uh, utilizing existing standard technologies because what they have is they have a standard processing on a silicon wafer or similar 
they uh, they are very uh, robust but they are limited in terms of what material that they can use they cross contaminate uh, each materials in, in different processes they are extremely standardized uh, this is as a benefit and also a huge disadvantage uh, you cannot use this type of technologies when you want for example make a smart glasses on a curved surface or with nanostructures so with like uh, unconventional optical elements and uh, this is uh, where um, uh, additive manufacturing comes and particularly our technology because we can work uh, on a, with a non-standard materials we can easily avoid problem of cross-contamination and we can easily work on complex surfaces or structured surfaces and this is a huge advantage that we are providing to all of these mentioned applications and emerging applications uh, that nobody else can provide. Mm -hmm. Now, what all of this means for us, that we are bringing uh, the, the times when innovation would happen in absolutely different way, with absolutely different unimaginable applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, I would, I would like, because at Kizuna we always talk about the mindset, and I think it was a really nice link, you know, um, to, to um, the people and innovation in general. Um, Jay, maybe you can start here. Um, how do, how do you think other players in the manufacturing industry, um, you know, perceive or respond to this technology? now in this very moment you know is this too you know sci-fi yet or like what's what are what are the 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 critical points here so mostly industries are focused on their SAS business our businesses are built around our physical products if we are not talking about a tech company that is doing some kind of social network stuff and so on um so majority of the companies are built around or oriented around physical products. They are highly specialized onto their own workflows, their own processes. So of course, in the first lane, they have this, how I've just already described it, like a horse with its blinders. They only see their own way. They need to be pushed a bit out of their comfort zone to take off the, these blinders and to see what else they can do. Um, so companies have to relearn their business. They need to see what else can they do with their existing possibilities, where else do they fit. This will be as well a huge, let's say, success formula for the future, because if due to highly optimized manufacturing, if we can expect that mobility, mobility will increase, but the amount of vehicles will go down. Mm -hmm. So here, of course, if you don't build 2 million, 3 million, 10 million vehicles per year anymore, but significantly less, you have a lot of capacities that are simply unused. So here adapting with such technologies or becoming part of an ecosystem that is healthier contributing to the society, you can change and shift from this linear economy where everyone is just doing his own step towards a circular economy and towards a circular society. So collaboration, cooperation, acting together. There is place for everyone. One thing that I would like to, to, to point out in, 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 in addition is um, I like to work with Japanese clients because Japanese industry is built around understanding so they try to understand, they look from the Western perspective like if they are slow, but the only thing what they are doing is to be precise, to understand every single step and therefore to identify opportunities. Mostly I'm using the example of Yamaha. Yamaha has started to build pianos and so on. This was a knowledge that they have, they have set up, they've understood how, how woodworking uh, 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 works like, they started to understand metal and so on and so on. Of course, sooner or later, they started to build as well furnitures, wood is wood. They started to build saxophones and so on because metal is metal. And sooner or later, furniture, metal, make sound, 
they have built motorcycles. And this is the thing, <laughs> if you start to understand what you are doing, if you start to understand what your employees can do, then you can truly completely convert, reinvent your company again and again and then again, and really bring value. This is what I've experienced with my clients in Japan, that they have this necessary, necessary kind of thinking. I'm always referring to their mindsets like uh, Kintsugi and uh, Motanai, where it's simply not wasting anything. And we in the West, with such technologies, maybe it will come into our mind. What else can we do un uh, um, uh, in, 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 instead of being stuck in our, I'm just folding metal, building a box out of it, put four wheels onto it and selling cars. And this is what I will do for the next 120 years. I, I just want to add here, this is exactly uh, uh, what we want to do. And uh, I would just would say, we already started uh, working with Japanese companies. Uh, I really like uh, the Japanese mindset and, uh, because they, they were very fast. We, we particularly started collaboration with Sony uh, they are very fast in sporting opportunities. The, of course, uh, there is a challenge that the day uh, moving a little bit slow, but I think this is like in our case, it's even a benefit that they are not speeding up uh, us because the life cycle for us of development of certain things is quite long and they are patient enough. And this, this is, I think, I observe for many uh, Japanese companies, which is really cool. Uh, another thing that one uh, what uh, what uh, UJ is saying is important we want to implement and this is why I moved to our advanced manufacturing hub concept a hub uh, concept that instead of just focusing on uh, one application and delivering only machines this is something that uh, we do and we focus in but we don't really want to only focus on this because technology is so versatile it can make so much value for different industries, for different applications, that it's actually not wise even to, to focus on one thing. Uh, of course, we need to start somewhere, and then we're focusing on one, one particular thing um, uh, that I, I already mentioned. However, going forward, developing in one area something useful, we can easily transfer to another one and create absolutely new uh, areas of activities and opportunities for, for the company and then for society. And this is what is the most intriguing thing here. Mm. Because you never, you would never be boring to do the same and the same. You, there would be always cycle of innovation. You will always create something new and amazing. Yeah. Maybe we can talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> also, I think, maybe the, the secret behind um, Atlant Frindi. And I think Let's talk about people here at this stage again. You know, what does um, this this movement, let's say, or this like groundbreaking um, innovation means for people working in manufacturing? I mean, I don't know. Maybe Jay, you want to start, or Maxime? You know, like what's what's your what's your thought on this? Because we said, you know, it's about co-creation. You know, but also like the people are working in manufacturing industry and. Um, yeah, what can a 3D printer do? What cannot a human do, you know? Like, yeah, what's your thought on this? Look, the thing is that currently our industries are more or less following... Uh, no, do you know the movie Modern Times from Charlie Chaplin? Yes. Okay, I hope all everyone in the audience knows this as well. Charlie Chaplin was working on a conveyor belt doing just one <laughs> movement. <laughs> If he would not stop, he would do this movement until he dies, maybe even at the conveyor belt. The thing is, the industrial revolution, how it started, was built amongst military hierarchies. Someone thinking, and then you have the whole execution. Innovation, circularity works different. Mm -hmm. So right now, we already experience a huge shift. This whole manufacturing that we have right now, the people are becoming independent, more or less independent, because these movements that they have to make are becoming universal. So in the past, with this one movement, they could only do one task in one conveyor belt for the rest of their time. Now, 
with more flexibility in our manufacturing, with industrial robots, with and so on and so on, you can be a, a bit more, slightly uh, more free. If you are working on the ideation side, in the office and so on, here an interesting effect came. The people are becoming independent from their employer. So the company needs to attract these people. Not anymore the people are applying somewhere. And here with such technologies, it could even on the conveyor belt, on the pure manufacturing layer, democratize this. Because if the machine is doing the pure manufacturing, the people, the mindset of the people here can go and give advice because they have the, the necessary knowledge how parts should fit into, into each other. How should you design something to make it workable? So when Maxim is describing his, uh, uh, his uh, manufacturing hubs, many people that before have been in manufacturing could simply help others to create products because of their knowledge. So not really doing the stuff anymore, but advising, helping others, really democratization of the whole manufacturing, where you will have local flavored, um, maybe even computers, local flavored uh, uh, um, uh, products that you might buy, let's say, in north of Munich, but not somewhere else. It doesn't need to be transported. You don't need it somewhere else. It only fits here. So this localization, distribution of smaller parts, really getting uh, the necessary things that we need in the area where we need it. Mm -hmm. These are my thoughts. So the people will not really be unemployed. They will just transition into something different. Their knowledge will be valued. They will be appreciated. Yeah, Maxime, your thoughts on this? How do you how do you see people in the next generation of manufacturing in general? <clears throat> I, I fully agree with Jay, and I think uh, we now in transition phase of our uh, civilization. Um, it's kind of a renaissance of individualism, where individualism becomes a, a part of the future uh, innovation, when everyone becomes uh, so valuable with their thoughts and. Uh, way of uh, development than more important than any machines so uh, the industrial revolution was happening in around technologies not around people and now we with digital age with all these uh, uh, new technologies we are focusing again around uh, a human like in ancient times like in uh, renaissance <clears throat> this is the most uh, amazing part because we now bring in the human uh, and actually uh, the human innovation mindset into the major part as a central part that what we creating and how we creating and we create and the goal is for our new civilization is to create innovation for the better existence of a human mm -hmm. unless there are different people in the world that want to create wars so this is a, another ethical aspect which i don't know if we want to touch today uh, how these technologies can be used against uh, humans. But uh, I leave it uh, this topic to you to decide if you want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, let's just talk about it. Like, you can just <laughs> as an example. I think we have a little bit more time because I so, think I'm very so curious. Yeah. From positive side, uh, uh, from positive, uh, positive ethical side, uh, all of these uh, technologies, our technology, D2 manufacturing or network centric technologies, because the, or as Jay said, the localized uh, or technologies that in, enable localized manufacturing. The benefit of this, that there is no need to create a very complex logistics and supply chains that you manufacture something in China and then deliver in US or in South America, uh, that everything can be done locally and uh, basically bring in security, national security uh, into the proper level. But, uh, and this, this can enable absolutely different innovation cycle. In a democratic societies, this is important when people get freedom and their innovation in the, uh, the individuals create can boost the, the development of the society and the country. But if you imagine an opposite situation when the uh, totalitaristic or authoritarian countries uh, start using these technologies to create weapons, then 
uh, this is a negative side of that. And uh, there's like how this can be developed, we can, we can only guess. Uh, of course, in these societies, innovation doesn't happen with the same pace. We can only, uh, in my opinion, we can only think in the way that, okay, in innovative, highly uh, creative societies, innovation can happen much faster than in other type of societies. But this is, a, you know, a, only a guess. We might have a different possibilities that uh, these technologies develop in, uh, in uh, uh, non-democratic societies will enable the, uh, the, those countries to go in wars and create smart weapons. Mm. Um, Max, so, sorry for interrupting here. Um, I have quite a positive view on, on this technology. Because when you have this, this decentralization, it, this democratization of the manufacturing process, it is as well something like education for the people. They do not fear. It's, it's not so easy if you can produce something, if you are not depending on this whole global supply chain and some kind of oppressive regime is, is, is whatever doing. If the people have everything what they what they need, if they can produce everything what they can, we are talking in the digital age about the creator's economy. This is mostly used for digital products, for digital assets. But with your technology, we can transfer this creator's economy as well into the physical space. So when you as a society do not need to have fear, if you can lift your creativity, if you can build in these common structures, as part of societal de development, um, I guess that any kind of oppression, because oppression is based on centralization. If you decentralize these structures, there is simply no place for this. And my guess is everything what is currently going on is just the last hooray, is the last glimpse of these past times, simply being extremely scared to lose their position. And we are in this healthy transition into decentralization, into a true together. Mm. I, I fully agree with you. Uh, I lean to this uh, view as well. Uh, what I mentioned is uh, the two possibilities which we need to, to consider to be more or less objective, right? Yes. Uh, and, and I don't believe that uh, that these type of uh, regimes they they can use uh, this in a in a in a way that let's say in the most efficient way let's say like this also there are a lot of technical solutions that can easily cut down them from usage let's say simply a digital a gps lock installed on the machine or like a gps tracker on the machine or a lot of different things that uh, doesn't allow uh, certain people to use technology for their uh, evil benefits. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. The time comes to an end, unfortunately. Um, so I have a last question and um, I want us to time travel to 2050 um, and also bring it back now a little bit, you know, not only manufacturing, but also um, mobility. I mean, Maxi, maybe you can start, you know, how do you imagine mobility and the next generation of manufacturing in 2050 and if you could summarize this a little bit you know what is your like your vision you know be dreamy you know be creative um in this um what's your outview um i think it would be amazing times uh, you know we now moving with electric electric mob uh, electric mobiles or, or cars uh, and uh, all these high-speed uh, trains into uh, mobile office concept. So the way the technology develops, and especially like a display interactive technologies, uh, they would bring uh, the possibility creating uh, offices just directly in the car when the autonomous car can drive you uh, somewhere and you can have touch screens around and then you can play with them and then do the, some amazing work the cars can read your mind and understand just with uh, half uh, uh, thought what you want to achieve. And this would be some, something like this. And we can easily travel between countries very fast. What all of these technologies will give us that all this type of in innovation can happen ex much faster than we can now. So we spend the decades to develop 
something new let's say even for uh, iphone uh, we had to make uh, several types of mobile phones to come to uh, uh, basically smartphones now innovation would be happening within few years and this is the most crazy and what would be in 2050 i can only dream but definitely we will get much more freedom and much more creative solutions that we can start implementing. Wow. Thank you so much for, for being here, Maxime. Um, that was great. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Jay, um, same question to you, you, as always. <laughs> thank you. Well, 2050, um, about the pure technological solutions, um, it, what kind of batteries? That I really cannot say. I just know the iterations, especially with these technologies, will become shorter. So we will come far easier to a solution. This, this con continuous improvement might happen even within one generation. So what I see is modularity with these technologies. What I see is high efficiency. If you can print out a completely new type of battery, if you can combine different types of technologies into one device, this is something by 2050 with such technologies will be possible. One thing that Maxi mentioned before, uh, I would like to point out as well, um, the individualization within the mass production so that you can have devices that are exactly how you want to have them, that might be like the Renaissance, might be again human centric mm -hmm. for us, from us, for us. And exactly this is describing again Kizuna. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is also for me, I really feel that well, I think that these technologies, um, they are so fast, you know, maybe we can't imagine how fast they will be. So it will save us so much time. And we as humans can really focus on not only other things, but really like, um, start creating again and um, really use our minds our brains to develop a new world um, and a new age and i'm super excited um, i hopefully you know i experience a little bit of that i mean 2050 is not too far away um again if you want to you listeners reach out to us if you have any suggestions you can contact us on our future navigation website it's in the description and um, yeah, thank you so much again, Maxime, for being here today. Thank you. See you very soon. And um, yeah, have a beautiful rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Have a great one. Stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.